Hi everyone and welcome. If this is your first time visiting my channel, I am Adrian, and I have been doing historical costuming online under the name Miss Philomena since uh, about 2007, uh, way back in the days of Live Journal. Today I want to talk about the adventure that is working from original knitting and crochet patterns and books. I say adventure because it's not always a straightforward process to go from the written pattern to the finished piece. There wasn't really a universal standardization for stitch notation, at least for knitting, until sometime later in the 19th century, although um, there was already a distinct difference between US and UK crochet notation as early as the 1840s or so. Uh, the same goes for sizing methods for needles and hooks. Different publishers would use different gauges, uh, including the, the circle gauge, the crescent gauge. Uh, there's several different types of bell gauges, not all of which are the same sizes. Um, but generally the gauge was named for the shape that it was. Uh, needles and hooks also tended to be more concentrated in the smaller size range, some of which can be hard to find modernly because they just don't make them that small anymore. And incredibly large needles weren't included in gauges at all, but would instead be referred to by either their circumference or diameter usually. Yarn weights, at least, seem to be more consistent across sources, generally ranging from what is a modern lace weight or cobweb weight uh, into worsteds. And there is occasional mentions of bulky yarns as well, but those tended to be not for wearable pieces uh, and definitely not for accessories, but more like cushions and blankets, stuff like that. Sadly, some of the varieties of wool mentioned in period patterns have no direct modern equivalent, most notably in multicolored and variegated yarns. The way they're dyed now is not quite the same. Uh, a lot of the hardware as well, especially when it comes to various popular styles of purses throughout the 19th century, are no longer manufactured either. Um, original pieces can be found occasionally on places like eBay or Etsy, um, but it's not always guaranteed. <clears throat> it's not impossible to find original books and magazines either on Etsy or eBay or through various other antique booksellers either, but often the older the book, the rarer it is and the more expensive it can be. Uh, luckily, there are places like Google Books, Archive.org, Hathie Trust, and AntiquePatternLibrary.org, which have scanned originals of public domain books that can be mostly downloaded for free. Um, Hathie Trust, unlike the others, does require some type of academic institution partnership to be able to download uh, certain publications in their entirety, um, stuff like uh, Godey's Ladies Book and Peterson's, you can't without a special sign-in, um, but you can download single page from, from those books uh, for free. Uh, there are also sellers on eBay and Etsy that list um, original scans, or scans of originals, I should say. Uh, it's really easy to find lots of scanned PDFs. Um, which can have up to a hundred or so books for, you know, generally like five to fifteen dollars. Um, I've never bought one of those listings myself, generally because they don't tell you anywhere in the listing um, what titles are included in, in the large lot, and I don't want to take the risk that some or even all of them can be found for free online. So. I, I have, however, bought um, individual scanned books from sellers who are scanning pieces from their own private collections. So I have done that before. Um, Project Gutenberg also does have books to download, but at least for the few that I've looked at, they tend to be transcriptions uh, rather than the original scanned book itself. And my personal preference is always for the original and unaltered book when I can find it, not somebody else's version that they've typed up. Anyway, 
Uh, I downloaded what the first of what would eventually become my sizable PDF library all the way back in 2011 when I was first dipping my toes into the world of beaded knit purses. My favorite book was the Priscilla beadwork book, which I've actually since found an original copy of. <laughs> it was published in 1912, but it includes patterns for some earlier styles of purses, uh, such as pitcher or jug purses, which were really popular in the 19th century, as well as a few different uh, shapes of purse that use what they call in the, the old purse stitch. Um, most of the PDFs in my library have been downloaded since early 2017. I was actually preparing for a three-day 1860s event that would take place in November, and I wanted some nice, warm, cuddly accessories for the time that I would be spending outside. And it was in the hunt for patterns besides the rather ubiquitous Godey's shawl and Sontag that really sent me down the rabbit hole. Uh, most of the books I have are either from American or British publishers, simply because I only speak English, I don't speak any other languages, but I do have some scanned issues of La Mode Illustrie from France and um, Der Bazaar from Germany. Uh, at the time of filming this video, I actually have almost 17 gigabytes <laughs> worth of PDFs in my uh, pre-1930s fiber arts folder. Uh, why 1930 is dividing line? That's just where I stick my personal divide between historic and vintage. Uh, because my collection is so large and it can be hard to keep track of patterns that I like and where they come from, I actually started myself a binder. Originally it was just one, but it's since grown into two, one for knitting, one for crochet. And basically if I like a pattern, I just print it out and uh, pop it in my binder along with a note for what book it's from and when it was published and if i've done any work on it let's see i will then put any notes i've made on the pattern in my binder as well and i have it vaguely organized by what type of thing it is such as shawls purses uh, caps and headwear and then within the sections i have them ordered chronologically. Um, as a system, it works well for me. So, as I said before, there was no standardization across publishers in the 19th century, and in some cases there were no standardizations for pattern quality either. The Laurel Leaf Shawl Pattern, um, which was first published in 1845 in the Practical Companion to the Work Table by Elizabeth Jackson, uh, is actually somewhat infamous in historic knitting groups for basically being unknit unknittable as written. Uh, there are a few modern interpretations of that pattern that do correct the issues, um, and they can be found online. I myself haven't tried any of them, so I can't speak for which might be best or closest to the original spirit of the pattern, but I know there are people who have put a lot of work into making that pattern work. Now, that's not to say that every pattern is horrible and has to be completely rewritten either before it is workable. Um, of the various pattern creators whose patterns I have used in the past, I have found that uh, Mrs. Jane Gauguin and Mademoiselle Eleanor Riego de la Branchardier, uh, my apologies if I pronounced her name wrong, I'm just gonna call her <laughs> Mademoiselle Riego from now on. Um, those are almost always correct as written, and apart from translating the patterns into modern terminology, I have had pretty much very little to no correcting to do as I've worked from those patterns. Um, the only thing that pops into mind is uh, one of Mrs. Gauguin's knitting patterns, where in a single line out of hundreds in this pattern, a stitch count was off by like two. Um, Another thing I found is the more recently a pattern has been published, the more likely it is to work as written, but there are always exceptions to that as well. Um, recently I had some very frustrating moments working from uh, this booklet, Crocheted Edgings and Insertions, book number two by Adeline Cordet, which was published in 1916. Um, as well as the first book in the series, which I only have a PDF of. I haven't found a 
an original copy of. I started with this edging here on the cover, um, and this worked up beautifully um, with no problems at all when I did a test swatch. And that ease that I was able to use that pattern, uh, I'll be honest, it lulled me into a false sense of security when I went to then try this matching insertion lace up here. Oh boy, did it have problems. Uh, namely, it was a row short to be able to actually repeat. <laughs> Um, and after working on some of the other patterns between both book two and book one, I actually had more patterns I found either didn't work as written or left out some important info needed to make the repeats actually work um, than patterns that I could <laughs> use without having to heavily rework them. Um, I'm actually going to come back to that book a little more in depth a little later on. The last thing I want to talk about about before getting into the details of my method for working from original patterns is to talk translation versus interpretation. Uh, within the historical knitting and crochet community there doesn't seem to be an overall separation between the two terms and I've seen some creators use the terms interchangeably and and I'm not criticizing for that I promise. Um, but to me at least I consider them two separate and distinct things. Uh, my definition of a translated pattern is one that has been taken from the original and modernized the stitch terminology. And perhaps there were some minor corrections needed, uh, such as a st stitch count some, somewhere being slightly off or other small things that would generally be considered errata in a pattern. Um, but otherwise, the original pattern works as written and doesn't need major changing. Um, an interpretation to me is therefore a pattern that does need major rewriting because it is otherwise unworkable as originally written. Or, which I will give a couple examples of in a little bit, a pattern that nominally does work as written, but as I've tested it and worked with the pattern, I've made some changes either for the ease of knitting or crocheting it or for aesthetic reasons or whatever else. Um, or both of the things I just said, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, these to me are versions that create the spirit of the original pattern or perhaps they are to get, to get it to look what, like what it's drawing or photograph if one exists with the pattern, but aren't the the actual written text without changes. Um, again, this is just my way of thinking about these two, and I'm not criticizing anyone who doesn't <laughs> categorize their patterns the way I do. So, all of that being said, let's get into how I actually work with antique patterns. Okay, so you've got your pattern, whether it's from an original book or perhaps you only have scans. Um, I'm going to pull a pattern out of Modern Fancy Work. I don't have an exact publication date for this because it isn't listed in the book, but I'm guessing sometime in the 1890s. I could be wrong. Uh, what I'm actually going to do out of this book right now is this rose edging here page, on page 179. Um, before I started this, I did make a copy of the pattern just so I can work off of this. Um, this is an antique book that is over 100 years old. I don't want to be constantly opening and closing it and putting stress on the spine unnecessarily. So I made a copy of my pattern. I also made a quick printout of my page of stitching directions. Interestingly, this book was published in the US. It's listed um, as published by the Housekeeper Corporation, which is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but it uses UK terms for the crochet. Not a huge deal. Uh, while I am making my notes, though, because I am a US crocheter, I'm going to be changing the terms into US terms. So I just want to <laughs> point that out as I start doing it. So what I need to do this as I need my pattern, I need, I've got my notes, which I've already written the very first couple of things down on, and I need some 
thread and a crochet hook to test it with. This is a size 10 crochet cotton. It's just a very basic, easily obtainable uh, material to use. And since something, something like this would have been done in probably a cotton thread anyway, it works really well for doing a test sample with. So this starts with make a chain of 14 stitches, which I actually already have done <laughs> just to save a little time. So I'm going to just go ahead and start looking right at row one, which is turn the work, turn and work one treble in the sixth stitch from the end, six chain, one treble in the fourth stitch of the foundation from the last one worked, two chain, one treble in the next stitch, but one, three chain, one treble in the same stitch as before, two chain and one treble in the last stitch of the foundation. So as I said, I'm going to be switching this into US terms. So this tells me skip five, double crochet. Then I'm going to skip three, which is the fourth stitch from the last one. Do another, oops, let me not forget the chain. Chain six, then do another double crochet. Then chain two. Uh, these next set of stitches are worked all in one, so I am going to double crochet, chain three, double crochet in one. Oop, I forgot my skip. So skip one in one. Then we're going to do one more skip and double crochet in the last stitch of the row. So one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to double crochet into the sixth stitch. Chain six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we're going to skip three. One, two, three. One double crochet here. Chain two. Skip just one. Then this is going to be my not quite a shell stitch. Chain three. Then I'm going to double crochet back in the same stitch. Chain two. And then skip one and do my last double crochet in the last stitch of the foundation row. All right, second row. So as you can see in my printout, I'm missing some spots, including where I'm going to be sticking my first stitch here. Uh, basically, this was, you know, a mass print that was quickly done. So yeah, there are some printer errors in my book, but we can figure this out based on context clues. So we're going to, again, work six chain, one treble in, I'm going to assume that is the two chain then two chain, one treble, three chain. Somehow I always miss this line. Three chain, one treble, two chain, one treble, all in the same three chain. And then three chain fashion to the middle of the six chain with a single crochet, three chain, one treble in the last six chain and turn. So that is chain six. Double crochet in two chain bar. Chain two. Then I'm going to be working. Somehow my eye always goes from here to here, which I know is wrong because I I have read this pattern a few times. So all right. So then I'm going to be doing a bunch all in the same stitch again. So we've got double crochet chain three, double crochet, chain two, and double crochet 
and that is the three chain bar. Then we're going to chain three, slip into the center of six chain bar, then chain three again, and then double crochet into last loop. Two, three, four, five, six. Then I'm going to double crochet into this first chain bar here. Chain two. Now I've got my set of stitches that I'll go in here. So we've got double crochet, chain three, one, two. Three, double crochet, chain two, and double crochet. Oops. Then we've got chain three, one, two, three, slip. Chain three again, and then a double crochet into the loop at the end. Mm -hmm. And then we've got row three. So we've got work six chain, one treble into the last three chain. Six chain, miss three chain and two chain, one treble in the next three chain, then two chain, one treble, three chain, one treble, two chain, one treble, all in the same three chain. So we've got chain six, double crochet in three chain bar, chain six, skip, next two bars, and then we are going to double crochet, chain two, double crochet, chain three, double crochet, chain two, and a double crochet in three chain bar. right there one two three four five six I'm gonna skip this chain bar this chain bar and go into this one so we've got double crochet chain two double crochet, chain three, double crochet, chain two, and finally a double crochet. And that is the end of that row. And that is the end of the pattern. We just repeat from row from the second row so we're just going to repeat rows two and three to length so and there you have it a nice quick easy pattern that didn't take long at all to work out obviously with a longer and more complicated pattern it will take more time but this is how i go from my original pattern to a modern pattern 
Okay, so the next pattern I want to talk about is one that I am considering an interpretation, even though I've only made one change to it. Um, that is the Pyrenees Knit Scarf, which is one of Mrs. Jane Gauguin's patterns. Uh, as written, these, this pattern actually has six different types of decreases. I did simplify it, yes, but I only simplified it down to five different decreases. So it's not like I made a huge change, but I did make a slight change. Why does it have five different decreases, you ask? Because decreases are directional, and this is a lace pattern, which means there are both knit side decreases and purl side decreases. <laughs> this is a sample that I knitted up of the pattern. I am working slowly on the final piece. You can also see what a huge difference blocking makes uh, because it's not quite as, it's not as easy to see where all of my yarn overs and openings are <laughs> until it until it does get blocked. But because I did make this change, this is the type of pattern that I would consider an interpretation rather than a translation. And if you were wondering about that upside down T from the title of this video, it comes from Mrs. Jane Gauguin and the way she does her pattern notation. As you can see, most of her pattern notations are either one or two characters, which I will admit is really nice because it makes for very short uh, pattern notation compared to modern stuff. But also, slightly confusingly, rather than calling her knit stitches, not rather than using K for her knit stitches, she uses P for plain and then B for the purl stitches, which are back stitches. So that's another thing <laughs> to keep in mind for her patterns. But anyway, I was talking about upside down T, wasn't I? Here it is, upside down T, take in a back stitch by purling two together, having the wool in front. So an upside down T in Mrs. Gauguin's patterns is a purl two together. And now we're gonna take a couple minutes to talk about this pattern, specifically this one. Now, I worked with both the both of these, as I said. I did a sample up of the the edging and it the lace. Obviously it's not blocked, so it's not perfect yet, but this is coming out fairly, fairly well. I'm happy with how it looks. Now, the insertion, I didn't even bother to keep the first sample that I tried to crochet with this because I couldn't crochet it. <laughs> it was just, it's, it's basically, it's missing a line in its pattern. Not not helped by the fact that it is just a giant wall of text <laughs> in within the book itself. Um, as written, it only has 11 rows. And this needs to have 12 rows to be able to pop properly repeat because it needs to be an even number. One of the things that I try to do is I started with the pattern as written tried to chart it, that didn't work. I then kind of combined working with the shell shape from the edging pattern. And I, I used that stitch set to create what would be the pineapple in this. And then from there, I just kind of played a little bit with this, but I, I am not even set on what I have done so far as a final interpretation of this pattern because I'm still not done testing my attempt at fixing it but it can be correcting patterns can be a long and slow process I will admit that and it does take 
the, the weirder a pattern is, the more times you have to work on it and the longer it will take to correct it. But I could spend, you know, another half an hour talking about just that and I'm not going to right now. But if there is anything that I've talked about in this video that you are interested in me going further into depth on, especially when it comes to to correcting and trying to figure out how patterns are supposed to work, um, just let me know and I can cover it in a future video in further depth. I have no problem doing that. I just need to know you guys are interested in it. So I'm going to just set this little bit of frustration aside again for now. <laughs> So I hope you really enjoyed this video and I want to thank you for watching. <laughs> um, if you did like it, please subscribe, like this video, uh, and stick around for whatever I put out in the future. Thanks again and bye.